Hello, and welcome to day 12, session one of the IEEE Region 8 Virtual Student and Young Professional Congress. Just two days left now, but we are going to go out with style. Tonight we have IEEE Ukraine session, section, a workshop by the Region 8 Humanitarian Activities Committee, and an entrepreneurship workshop on Business Model Canvas, and a Professional and Educational Activities Subcommittee Chair speaking about his subcommittee can help you develop your career part. Before all that, a wonderful speaker lined up. Julia Reinhardt um, is a Data Protection Advisor and Fellow in Residence at Mozilla Foundation and lives in San Francisco. As a Mozilla Fellow in Residence, she investigates the possibilities and limits of European approaches to the regulation of artificial intelligence as well as their potential effects on smaller companies in Silicon Valley. As a data protection consultant, she advises US companies on compliance with the General Data Protection Regulation, regulation that's GDPR. She also works as a, as a strategic advisor in the areas of technology policy and crisis communication, and organizes international events and workshops on these topics. For the German Silicon Valley Innovators and the German Startup Association, she creates bridges between companies and the Silicon Valley ecosystem using trend scouting and networking at a leadership level. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Julie Reinhardt. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, it's good morning here, but uh, good afternoon for you probably. Um, I'm very happy to present to you this year. The IEEE is an amazing organization in your virtual congress for students and young professionals as well as women engineers in Region 8 uh, is a forum I feel extremely grateful to present to. It, it includes my home, Europe, so hello over there, and two regions, the Middle East and Africa, that are for me as an alumna of American University of Beirut, uh, very dear to my heart. I believe you have extremely relevant perspectives that I hope to benefit from in our subsequent Q&A. So um, I'm here to, uh, today to speak about regulatory trends for artificial intelligence, particularly those coming from Europe. Yeah, um, thank you, Gerard. I know this is not a topic otherwise featured, um, at your Congress, and I hope you will bear with me when we venture out into a topic uh, that is not top of mind for most of you. Um, but I expect this topic to be uh, at least as important as GDPR, the European Data Protection Regime that took effect two years ago, and that hit many in the technology space outside of Europe, and even some within, uh, unprepared. So, as with any te new technology, the use of AI brings both opportunity. No, 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 Gerard, back, please. Back, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you when to change slide. All right. Uh, um, as with any new technology, the use of AI brings both opportunities and risks. Um, citizens fear being left powerless in defending their rights and safety when uh, facing the information the asymmetries of algorithmic decision making and companies are concerned by legal uncertainty. Uh, click. Click, Gerard. Yeah, thank you. I'm not usually one to quote a CEO of Tesla and SpaceX Elon Musk, but uh, no doubt he's among those who said it in the pointiest ways. Um, mark my words, uh, he said, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Why do we have no regulatory oversight? So, of course, he's not the only one. <laughs> Gerard, please back. I will tell you when to change slide. <laughs> I say click. Is that okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> of course, uh, so uh, he's not the only one to say that. Other corporate leaders, including CEOs of Google, Microsoft, and IBM, have called for increased regulation, and so have activists, politicians, and respected scholars at academic research institutes and think tanks. Reason for this call is to action is the understanding that for all of its many benefits, AI also presents many risks, and they include biased algorithms, bi privacy violations, and the potential for injuries, both physical and immaterial, caused by detective software, a de defective software, for example, uh, with the increasing use of AI-based solutions in areas like criminal justice, healthcare, robotics, financial services, and education, corporate interests will inevitably um, conflict with societal benefits. 
And that conflict raises the question of what systems should be put in place to mitigate potential harm. My research for the Mozilla Foundation is focused on upcoming regulation in Europe for applications of artificial intelligence and how it could affect US companies, because I'm based here. Not the big te tech giants uh, that we all think, uh, think of and that all have their offices in Brussels observing and influencing these decisions, but the sw small ones that don't operate in Europe or globally yet. I know my focus is on the US, uh, home to many tech companies, uh, but if you have thoughts about this as an individual, but also if you're, you work for a company in your region that fits into what I'm looking at, I, I would love if you reached out and gave me feedback. On my last slide, I will share uh, my website and Twitter handle uh, again, and I'd be really grateful if, um, if you uh, sent me messages. So you could ask, uh, why would an organization outside of Europe be affected by European regulation? They only have, have to follow their local law. But actually, what we've seen with the European uh, General um, Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, click. Thank you. It's, a, it's that lots of businesses based solely outside of Europe are affected, mainly because they have European users, so they process personal data of European residents. And these residents of Europe are protected by GDPR wherever the, the processing of their data takes place. So I could go on forever on GDPR. It's a topic that is uh, that I know well and that I've worked on for years, including when I was still um, a diplomat and when it was uh, being um, negotiated among EU member states and I worked for one of them. Um, but an important experience that I want to share here um, from my research in and around Silicon Valley is that many US-based organizations that process personal data of uh, people around the world um, have decided to apply GDPR and extend all the rights that go with it to their customers uh, who are not European residents but live outside of Europe. I believe this is the case for many companies around the world and I see that IEEE also has that on their website. <laughs> Click. So uh, it gives those companies an edge in global compliance. It is easier for them in terms of handling complaints and requests. And so they say, uh, just give all of our customers all the rights that Europeans have. That's a very high bar. Um, and it's still easier for the organization um, than to sort out the customer's location and attribute different rights according to their location. GDPR offers them a legal framework and a set of standards that is at least compared to other less spelled out legislation or no legislation at all, relatively clearly adoptable. Click. Well, my clients are um, mainly small and medium um, enterprises based in the US with only some clients in Europe or with the mere intention of soon expanding to Europe. This privacy management strategy has been found with bigger tech firms as well. So the image on the slide shows the view from Salesforce's legal team space in, in San Francisco. And there's certainly part of these companies that I'm talking about. So please send me pictures in case you have seen anything similar in your countries. Organizations appreciate that there is a standard now that is law in one part of the world, but can serve as a guideline also for other parts of the world. And even if this guideline is more demanding than legislation in their markets outside of Europe, it makes life easier for them uh, to have one high profile standard than many different ones. And that creates the, the what I call the growing global privacy patchwork. Now, this was definitely a huge finding in the past two years, since May 2018, when GDPR became enforceable. Also, with the current US administration uh, here in Washington being relatively silent about data protection, and other countries like Japan or Israel following a rather GDPR-like model, that made the EU the de facto rule setter and technology policy worldwide in the important field that is data protection, as data is integral to all technology. What I want to find out now is whether we could expect uh, to see the same trend with upcoming EU regulation in other fields of tech policy, for example, artificial intelligence. Click. 
So if we look at the timeline of policy making on AI in Europe, that's the, the, uh, the upper line, the dark blue bubbles, we're pretty much in the uh, middle of concepts gearing up to become concrete policy proposals. As you see on that little timeline, after sketching first ideas and establishing a high uh, level expert group that has issued its proposals, the European uh, Commission issued a white paper early this year um, and started a consultation process in which more than 1,200 individuals and uh, advocacy groups, uh, researchers and companies participated. Um, most recently in July, the experts invited by the European Commission have issued an assessment list for trustworthy AI that companies and developers can use to assess their algorithm use. On the international level, that's the, the purple bubbles, uh, many of the concepts that form part of the European draft have been formulated as principles within the OECD, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development that most European countries, the US and many countries in Asia Pacific and South America are members of and adopted in May 2019. They promote uses of AI that are innovative and trustworthy and that respect human rights and democratic values. That's what it says in the principle. A month later, the G20, the world's biggest econ economies, have drawn from them heavily when they adopted their human-centered AI principles. And of course, these are all non-binding, but still highly influential. In the US, uh, the White House announced the, that's the, the green bubble, announced the American AI initiative, which uh, focuses on driving technological innovation and standards that to protect the competitive edge on AI. The White House last January uh, released 10 principles of, for federal agencies to follow when proposing rules governing um, the private sector's deployment of AI technology. These are binding and follow many of the same ideas, but they're very light touch with uh, lots of exceptions and a strong emphasis on leaving space for corporations in whatever way to innovate and compete globally. So it's a more hands-off free market view and a pretty stark renunciation um, of the careful approach that was initiated under the Obama administration in 2016, but that hadn't yet led to any actual US uh, legislation. So back to Europe, uh, right now, Brussels is working on a draft policy that is expected to be tabled to member states for negotiation around the beginning of 2021 as a legislative proposal, and that could, um, once those negotiations have been successful, become the world's first general regulation on AI. That's the ambition. Click. So uh, what will European AI regulation most likely look like? It is a three-prong approach um, with uh, first a, a substantial increase in public and private investments in AI to boost its uptake, but also funding for research, more cooperation between uh, researchers across Europe, and uh, better know-how to prepare for socioeconomic cha cha changes and challenges. This is called the ecosystem of excellence. Uh, and I would say that the numbers floating here don't add up in any way to what is seen in the, in the US or in China, but it's a start. Then uh, combined with the European strat strategy for data, which aims to improve the use of data by creating an EU single market for data to facilitate access to data and computing infrastructures, which is of course an essential requirement for the development and use of AI applications. And last, I've put it in the middle on the slide, uh, with the aim of an um, ecosystem of trust, important word, um, the com Commission uses a human rights first approach and details a number of requirements that uh, AI applications would have to fulfill in order to be considered trustworthy. This is the new framework that I will present on uh, further on. So of course, um, last but not least, exe existing EU laws and regulations already apply to AI solutions, including rules on data protection, so GDPR, um, non-discrimination, consumer protection, product safety and liability. Consumers expect the same level of safety and respect 
of their rights, whether or not a product or a system relies on AI, of course. In some cases, the AI-related aspects of these existing rules may be difficult to enforce uh, because AI is opaque uh, and unpredictable, complex and, um, and autonomous. In many cases, that's difficult to see from the outside. So in some cases, these existing rules might need to be up, uh, amended or updated. So I'll come to the requirements on my next slide, but I need to first underline that this uh, approach singles out high risk applications, um, please underline that, uh, which would become subject to strict requirements and not those that are considered low risk for which no additional legal requirements uh, would be imposed. For these, um, the commission is considering a voluntary labeling system that would cert certify compliance with parts of the requirements and that allow companies to market the AI, their AI products as trustworthy. So rather than introducing a generic AI regulation, this is a nuanced risk-based approach, possibly one that is application and technology specific. Um, however, this approach may also lead to uncertainty. And I personally worry that uh, high-risk sectors, um, specifically mentioned are healthcare, transport, energy, judicial, judicial decision-making and mass citizen surveillance, um, it, it still won't always be easy to determine, so it's very subjective. An algorithm use could be considered low risk for someone, uh, but actually has high risk consequences for someone else. Uh, plus, um, risk here is defined as a risk to an individual, which includes a whole category of AI applications that pose major collective risks. So from the current German EU presidency, I have heard that they are not happy with the way high risk is defined by the commission, and they think that there should be more nuances. Click, please. Developers of uh, high risk AI applications would be obliged to follow rules in these key aspects. Um, some degree of human oversight would be required ranging from uh, requiring human review before a decision is implemented to the possibility of human in intervention in real time or afterwards. This could be um, requirements on robustness and accuracy, the ability to react to inconsistencies, and that the application is resilient against the attacks and manipulation. Training data sets uh, need to be representative and comprehensive and comply with privacy and data protection rules. People to, uh, would need to be informed when they interact with an AI system and not a human. Um, and, and what its capabilities and limitations are. Developers would need to keep records uh, of how they selected what kind of training and testing data um, and how they pro programmed and trained the system <clears throat> to enable AI decisions to be traced back. And then uh, specific requirements uh, are planned for remote biometric ident identification. That's another word for facial recognition. Um, it's not a ban, but um, that was in a previous draft, but it disappeared. But, EU, but the EU insists, uh, the commission insists that data protection rules and the Charter of Fundamental Rights apply, so um, which already allow the use of fa facial recognition only in cases where this action is justified and proportionate. And that is subject um, to adequate um, safeguards. It says that there will possibly be an open discussion on whether exceptions could be justified. So as a developer, think of this like some kind of an FDA style, it's called FDA in the US, but um, apply the, the right term for your country, um, clinical testing, not for drugs, but for algorithms. What a commission, a commission official from the AI team in Brussels has recently told me is that they're looking at um, creating a clear legal framework, clarity and predictability for both consumers and companies. So that's the ambition in Brussels. Click. So allow me to talk about how I expect US companies to be affected by future EU regulation on AI, as this is what my research focuses on and where I'm based. Um, and I believe a lot is transferable to other countries outside of Europe. Um, the EU guidelines 
will likely have a ripple effect in the US since many, many American technology companies provide AI solutions and services to the EU. It was, will also impact US companies that EU investors are looking to buy and um, companies that uh, plan to expand into European markets. And of course, uh, the additional policy and regulatory measures that the EU considers will increase the cost of compliance and um, put the administrative burden and possible IP related difficulties on companies um, that develop or de deploy AI systems. And of course, um, on a less business and more political level, citizens in the US will uh, see what rights are granted in the EU, or and at least some of them could demand those rights as well, especially in progressive places like here in California. But not only. Um, here in the US, it's private businesses that are currently pushing harder for AI guidelines than government agencies. Uh, some of the big players like Microsoft, Google, IBM, and also Salesforce that I mentioned earlier have established internal principles on which they will base their AI development in the future. Click. So that is not ideal, but it's a first step. Um, internally established principles of AI ethics, as it's called, are hardly enforceable, and competitors are not bound by them. Also, there are many guidelines uh, around. So from a consu consumer point of view, it's hard to really know uh, where a company stands in terms of compliance. At least, um, I would say it obliges the company uh, that decides to go this way to face scrutiny um, about its products in the public. But it isn't designed to really calm citizens' uh, concerns on a broad base, because there are still players who don't feel bound by, by any of those principles. Click. Then there's self-regulation of industry. And by that, I mean that when government uh, rules are lacking, a whole industry designs and enforces new rules and standards for themselves. Usually, these would be codes of conduct or binding rules that an, an uh, industry establishes for itself, for example, within federations. Um, the hope would be that the industry collective action can change the incentives in a situation where the competitive dynamic of AI development leads to a prisoner's dilemma for both companies and state, states, uh, wherein both are incentivized to prioritize the fast development of AI instead of the safe development of AI. Unfortunately, um, this hasn't been successful so far, far at, or at least not impactful for now. Click. And that's why some uh, companies actively push government for more committed steps. I've often heard people in companies say that they look to Europe uh, for these obligations to come up. So companies that are based here in the US. These, they are mostly the ones um, who've seen the success of GDPR and are, are convinced um, their country needs a similar groundbreaking law regulating technolo uh, technological development, but they don't see that the current US administration is in any way interested in pushing that. The dominant view in Washington DC for the moment is that the US needs to lead an AI development uh, to compete with China, uh, no matter what. Uh, but uh, we're uh, just under 40 days uh, before the US elections. So that might also change. And lastly, uh, there's the way through local and state laws. Click. So we've seen with data protection uh, that um, here in the US that when the federal level doesn't move enough, the states engage more. There are some examples that state and local level have moved that are pretty promising. Uh, they don't have the reach to create general nationwide re regulation, of course, but they're creating smaller scale use cases for regulation, like um, regulatory sandboxes, that in, then in real life can be useful once the federal level is re ready to engage. So they test rules on a smaller level and then see what works if uh, the federal level is ready. Um, for instance, the California Consumer Privacy Act that took effect this year um, showed that a U.S. state can issue impactful legislation that addresses concerns about data protection and that significant fines can be levied against misuse of personal data. The CCPA 
as it's called, is far from perfect, I have to say. And I don't really see how it will be effectively enforced given so many imperfections. Um, but still, uh, it was quite a step. And many other US states have meanwhile issued their own privacy legislation. However, uh, most are less far reaching and more restrictive than the California law. A more recent example, more specifically from the AI field, again from California, is the BOT, the Bolstering Online Transparency Act, which um, makes it unlawful uh, for any person to use a bot to communicate or interact with another person in California online with the intent to mislead the other person about its artificial identity. This legislation specifically applies to bots that intend to influ influence voters as well as um, intentionally deceptive bots that uh, are used to sell goods or, uh, or services. It doesn't make bots illegal, but it requires them to identify uh, themselves as non-human. Uh, the law took effect just a few months ago on July 1st and only in California, and it doesn't clearly address how it applies to bots that don't originate here. But for instance, in other states, how enforcement it doesn't uh, it also doesn't say how enforcement would work then one last example for local action and this time regarding facial recognition tele technology the most uh, controversial area of ai use to date in this case when so far no federal guidelines exist to limit or standardize its use and few states rule state rules are in place cities feel left to decide for themselves what if anything to do the city of San Francisco last year uh, passed a bill to ban facial recognition technology for police and city agencies use. The, um, then other US cities followed suit, for example, Boston. In this case, it is only one sector government um, that is required to refrain from the use of this um, technology while um, private sector and individuals can still use it. But it shows an awareness that with the current state of technology development, organizations clearly aren't ready to use facial recognition in a safe and secure and responsible manner. And that there's a need for clear legislation that on a federal level, so far, no one has managed to pass. So as I mentioned before, what most technology companies are saying is that they look not to Washington um, here in the US, but to Europe when it comes to effective regulation in that field. And I wonder if that's the case also in your countries when you're based outside of Europe. So what I've been doing recently is to interview companies around San Francisco and Silicon Valley working on AI systems about the expected impact of European regulation on them and about their preparedness and sense of agreement with these principles. My focus, I mentioned that, is on small and medium-sized companies that are less in the focus of the media and that face the additional challenge of competing uh, with the tech giants in a field where size clearly matters. Because the more data you can gather, the better your AI system works. Um, I'm also interested in this type of company because the general impression with GDPR was that the small players have been losing ground due to compliance costs and that regulation blocks them more than the big ones. So, so far my interviews show that most, if not all my contacts have an understanding of the importance of rule setting around AI based systems and that they report having thought about limiting their own developments until political guidance is given what is admissible and what is not. All of them had required, experienced some uh, kind of adaptation process to GDPR two years ago. Some of them were my clients, so I helped them with that. And they reported having spent considerable money and time on compliance with rules that originated in Europe, but that several of them applied to all of their products and all users wherever they are located. Now, with AI regulation coming up, uh, they, they expect the same to happen, but there is disagreement on whether this kind of general regulation is even possible in a broad field like AI that includes smaller uh, applications that are considered to simply make life easier, as well as large systems of, for example, mass surveillance. 
Importantly, many of them also said that they expected European legislation to be faster, more comprehensive and more enforceable than any US attempt for regulation. Maybe that's a lesson learned from GDPR, and it doesn't mean this would be the same with the upcoming European policies, um, but it's a good indicator of the urge many players feel to prepare for rules and not to leave the space entirely to the big players and their lobbying power. So in my mind, um, although the EU's upcoming rules are geared primarily um, toward European firms, of course, and will become law only potentially sometime in the future, um, companies outside of Europe need to look at them already now. It won't be enough to just wait and see, and it's better to be prepared for the probability of AI regulation in Europe. Click. So um, again, if you have thoughts about this as an individual, but also if you work for a company that fits into what I'm looking at, I'd love if you reached out and gave me feedback. Here's uh, my website and Twitter handle on the bottom of the slide. If you're also interested in reading more about what else we're working on at the Mozilla Foundation, have a look at the Data Futures Lab we just launched that I put a link uh, in the center of my slide. So thank you for attending. I wish I could see you all in person. I hope you're all safe and stay healthy. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Where are your questions? I don't hear you. Ah, sorry, muted ah. microphone. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Julia. Thank you. Um, we have some questions. If you click Good. on the ask a question tab down at the bottom, you should be able to yeah. see five questions. Um, the first. Yeah. The first question so. is: Would you like me to read them out, or can you? Um, can you see the question? So. I see the the question of uh, about China. What is the situation of China in this process? So um, honestly, I uh, my focus is not on China. The situation is uh, very different there. Um, so China is um, is part of the G20, uh, uh, of course, and they have signed the principles that uh, the G20 adopted that are mostly based on the formulations that uh, the OECD found. Um, but of course, they are not binding and they are very vague. So um, interpretation is uh, up to each country. Um, and um, so I can't talk about legislation in China itself. Um, just uh, in its impact uh, for the US, um, there's a very, very high uh, sense of competition here, as you know, uh, especially from the Trump um, administration. And um, so because in China, like when you're looking from outside, the focus is so much more on, sp uh, on speed, on a fast uh, development instead of a safe development, but that's a perspective from outside uh, of China. Um, that's what the administration focuses on here too. Uh, it doesn't always correspond what, with what people or activists, other politicians, um, and even people in the technology space uh, feel. And that's why I talked about those other, um, you know, attempts to regulate um, that. So from the outside, and I'm outside of China, of course, um, it's more um, an incentive to, to go faster. Um, but I feel that uh, Europe, although there is that tendency too, of thinking that in the commission, at least, um, the tendency is more to say, no, we want to do it safely. We don't want to necessarily only go fast. Although, of course, there's a huge difference in speed of development and, and, and dimension. Um, so, um, does GDPR allow the commercial use of consumer data? Yes, of course it does. Um, so GDPR protects individuals' uh, data, personal data, and uh, it regulates how it can be commercially used. 
So um, there, I mean, of course, uh, you knew you need the commercial use of consumer data to even um, uh, to even make the technology work. And but what GDPR does is set uh, comprehensive rules that apply to all, um, not only technology, but all use of personal data of European residents. In case of dispute related to regulations, which is the third party charged for judgment? Well, that depends on where you are. <laughs> um, in, in Europe, uh, that's the national uh, data protection authorities and they cooperate uh, within the framework of GDPR in a certain way where a company is, uh, is located, where a resident whose uh, personal data is, uh, is processed is located. So they have a set up a system of who does what uh, within Europe. Um, uh, and uh, so you have to look into GDPR because it's kind of complicated to, to find out uh, which national data protection authority is, is responsible for an infringement, for example. Um, but uh, so in GDPR, it's pretty clearly regulated. On an international level, there's no such thing yet. Um, and then, of course, uh, when you look at outside of Europe at national um, or even sub-national like state um, uh, legislation that depends. It's very much a patchwork. So that's why I said global privacy uh, patchwork. And the same is true for AI. I mean, there is not even, um, there are, as I said before, uh, you know, small attempts of regulation here and there. And then, of course, existing laws that are specific to each country or even sub uh, sub level. Um, so that's the complicated situation that we're facing. And that's why I think it's so important to find agreement um, on a higher level um, so that people know uh, who to address. And also, and I mean, that's my job too, to, uh, that companies know uh, what they're allowed to, uh, to do and what they're not. And so there, I feel here in Silicon Valley, at least uh, with many companies that I'm working with, that they long for those uh, clear rules because right now, um, it's very hard for companies to know what is admissible and what is not and where to address their questions to. Next question, what about regular, oh, you're jumping. What about regulation and data protection in other regions such as African countries? Are they following Europe or having other regulations? So that is actually something that I would love to hear from you. So I've, I've been following um, like generally um, where data protection um, regimes pop up and that's been all over the, uh, the world. Um, but for AI, um, I can't really tell. Um, I know that there's a lot of discussions. So some countries uh, adopt something like GDPR, but then it's watered down by, by politics. For example, that's the case for Brazil. In India, there's a, a, a different uh, approach, but that is also pretty strict, but uh, follows their own rules. Russia as well, for example. So um, in Africa, I have to say, uh, I would love your indication, uh, especially when it comes to AI regulation for certain fields. I know that, uh, so I haven't heard of any comprehensive attempt to regulate yet, but I know uh, that uh, a lot of African um, countries are in touch with other uh, legislation to uh, like um, uh, countries to, to see what they want to transfer or not. Um, but really that will be something that I would love to hear from you. Um, will the move towards explainable AI um, mean, um, mean that algorithms must be made transparent so that the code can be independently policed for regulatory compliance with only the training data kept private. Yeah, so um, in the European um, proposals, which as I said and stressed, they're only proposals. I mean, they're not even uh, uh, official proposals yet, but when you look at the white paper uh, that was published uh, in February um, by the commission, it says that uh, yes, when there's a dispute, for example, somebody feels um, discriminated against by an AI system, for example, for applications, uh, HR applications or something like that, um, and there's a dispute in front of the court, for example, uh, the company would need to uh, make their AI system uh, transparent. Um, 
so that uh, a judge or whoever could look inside and see if there's actually a reason to be worried and that the discrimination was built inside the um, the data the the system whether uh, you know intentionally or not um, so yeah the transparency is a big uh, a political demand um, and uh, so uh, yes uh, it's kind of like you know with any kind of regulation for uh, medicine or or even food or other uh, systems that the demand is that they the the company would need to show what they actually did and whether that was uh, faulted or not thank you i think we've yeah. managed to get to all the questions <laughs> Do you have comments? Um, I have many comments. <laughs> oh, you, but also the audience. <laughs> no, really, I mean, I, I mean that seriously. Um, you cover such a wide uh, geographic area that, uh, and I, I already mentioned that I don't work on many of those, uh, you know, um, areas, but I, they would add up, if I knew more about them, they would add up to, uh, you know my general picture so um, I would really like even later on if you've done some research or so I would be very happy about an email or a, you know direct message on Twitter or something and I see some of the attendees have answered a little bit in the comments as well with regards to the African countries and their regulations oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah so i mean what uh, what is interesting also is of course in the case of gdpr the um the impression now from the outside of europe is uh so anything that european companies can do uh, with the outside world is of course always uh also um based on the gdpr so a lot of other countries and companies there had to had to deal with why Europeans do this and that, and um, it has impacted sometimes also negatively their their cooperation because the Europeans just weren't ready to um, to share data on, on personal data on specific things. Um, so I'm sure that that has been an issue also in Africa and the Middle East. Um, but um, yeah, it would be interesting to see how that affects AI, its application and its development. And there's a lot of applications in all those countries, of course. Do you think there's anything as engineers yeah. we should be doing to try and help shape the regulation or maybe influence the regulation and try and make sure that it stays on track and doesn't go overboard and that it doesn't infringe on the creative rights of developers or yeah. Um, Do you think that the that suspect? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, don't feel like a suspect. Um, a designer will be the judge in this type of regulation. Well, I mean, that is honestly the case with all development of technology when you whether you build a laundry machine or a washing machine or um, or a TV or I mean, um, if you know what uh, what rules are um, are in place, of course, it's easier for you to follow them and in your in your development. Um, and uh, but usually in those uh, companies, there's also a legal team uh, that can guide um, engineers um, for that. But it definitely helps when those um, rules are clearly set out and are not too complicated so that not just the legal team understands them. So that's why I'm also talking to um, when I, you know, in my in my daily work as a data protection consultant, I don't only talk to legal teams and companies, although they're officially my main contact. But I talk to engineers and explain or ask them first, how does it work when you develop this and that uh, feature in your project? A product and um, so that's much easier than to see hey I mean they don't really have to freak out or be scared uh, it's just this additional click here and you know that means this and that um, so in AI I think a lot would be gained if engineers knew um, more or less the 
the traffic code, you know, like which way to go and where not to go, um, because that would save them uh, time and money. Um, and it would make the development much more effic efficient. Um, but definitely, um, so it helps knowing the rules. They need to be clear, uh, to be understood. Um, but I wouldn't talk uh, about a developer or designer as a suspect. You're always, I mean, you're at the core of innovation. You're the ones creating all those things that, you know, we all want uh, to, you know, use. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of clarity of rules. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Julia. You're welcome. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, All right. We are now going to have a short 10 minute break. And when we come back, we have not one, not two, but three parallel workshops. So attendees, you get to decide which you want to go to. We have a workshop by the Region 8 Humanitarian Activities Committee, the, an entrepreneurship workshop on Business Model Canvas, and a professional and educational activities workshop. Um, so you just click on the schedule at the top of the screen, and you can choose which workshop you want to go to. Um, and those will start at 10 past, 10 past the hour. <laughs> um, and I said goodbye. <laughs> and uh, have a very, very good rest of the Congress. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very From much. From San Francisco. Again. We hope we can host Bye. you again soon. All right. Hopefully in person. Yes. We're kind of stuck here in the US, you know, with the pandemic and everything. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.